Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yes. And can you see the PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay, it's recording now. All right. So let's begin. So welcome back, guys. So let's see if we can finish um, the pharmacology and the pathology portion um, today. So this is from first aid. If you just read first aid for the pharmacology, pharmacology part, I think um, you're going to be fine. So antimicrobial um, therapy. We're going to talk about all of these. Peptidoglycan cross-linking. Think about your penicillin, cephalosporin, carbapenems, and monobactams. Peptidoglycan synthesis, your VAC, acetracin, Membrane integrity, your DAPTO and polymyxins. Folic acid synthesis reduction, methylation. Sulfonamides or methoprim, metronidazole for DNA integrity, rifampin, mRNA synthesis. So basically the questions for your drugs, pharmacology, a mechanism of action, and the major side effects. Those are the high yield points. Okay, let's go. Penicillin. Just out of curiosity, um, if you look at the structure of the penicillin, you have a side chain, right? What else is in there? You have a beta-lactam ring. Aside from penicillin, can you give me another class of drugs that has a beta-lactam ring? Carbapenem. Excellent. Carbapenem. What else? Cephalosporins. As Astrionam. Okay, those are the four. Then that's the beta lactam. So if someone is allergic to penicillin, don't give cephalosporin because you can have cross allergies between them. Side chain, beta lactam, beta lactam ring, ring, and you have the um, thiazolidine ring. This is um, you have a sulfur there. Okay, it's a thiazolidine ring. This is what determines the penicillin. What's the mechanism of action of penicillin? So the bacteria is constantly breaking down or remaking the cell wall. So penicillin inhibits cross-linking between your peptidoglycan wall um, synthesis. So it inhibits transpeptidase, high yield. What residue does penicillin bind to in order to inhibit the peptidoglycan in the cell wall, the cross-linking? What residue, what protein residue does it bind to? Phenylalanine, tyrosine, what, what residue specifically? The D ala, like alanine? Excellent, excellent. It's the alanine residues. Remember, your NAM and your da, NAD, they are your backbone. And then you have your alanine, you have, what else is in there? Deglutamate and um, lysine. So this is your backbone. They stack up like pebbles like stones on top of each other. So the backbone is the NAM and the NAG. And then you have the alanine, uh, deglutamate, and then L-lysine. And then between those sticking out of those pebbles, you have your um, pentaglycine chain. Pentaglycine chain. Then you have cross-linking. Um, so the mechanism of action high yield for penicillin, it binds alanine to alanine residues, right? which links the lysine and alanine. So it binds to transpeptidases, right? It mimics alanine residues. It inactivates that enzyme. So what if you don't have a cell wall? Then <laughs> if, cell, if um, cell wall breakdown is greater than cell wall creation, you can have autolysis, right? Cell death. High yield, don't forget, all beta-lactam antibiotics. Cephalosporins, penicillin, carbapenems, um, astronam, they have a similar mechanism of action. Now, let's talk about your natural penicillins. Penicillin G is what? PO, IM, or IV, or both? Or three of them. So penicillin G is actually IM and IV. Okay? G. Penicillin V, as in victory, is oral. Okay? Question, guys. Let's, let's go back. Rheumatology. 
a gout drug. It inhibits the renal secretion of penicillin. What is it? It boosts the penicillin levels. Probenicin. Excellent. Good job. Good job. Probenicin, right? Um, how do penicillins acquire resistance then? How does, I'm sorry, wrong question. How does the bacteria acquire resistance to penicillin? That's another high yield, right? How does it require resistance? Beta lactamase. Okay, you do beta lactamase enzyme, excellent. But what's the main mechanism of resistance of the bacteria? They have like the bony R group that prevents the beta lactamase binding. So it modifies PBPs. It modifies penicillin binding proteins, right? For example, your strep pneumo, it produces altered PBPs. Don't forget that. Also, it reduces like bacterial cell penetration via what mechanism? The bacteria may decrease the number of your porins. Remember the porins? These are gram-negative proteins that transport nutrients and waste. So they, the bacteria decreases the number of porins. Either they produce beta-lactamase enzyme or the main mechanism is they modify penicillin binding proteins so that they acquire resistance. Someone says beta-lactamase. I'm intrigued about beta-lactamase. What is beta-lactamase anyway? Or penicillinase. That's another name. They're going to trick you. They're not going to put um, beta-lactamase. They're going to put penicillinase. Don't get fooled. It's the same thing. What is it then? It just cleaves the beta-lactam ring so then the penicillins aren't effective anymore. Exactly. Commonly seen in gram-positive or gram-negative bacteria. Beta-lactamase enzyme commonly seen in gram-positive, gram-negative. Gram-positive. Gram -positive. Careful. Careful. Negative. It's gram negative, guys. Gram negative um, bacteria. Specifically, what? Gram negative rods. Don't forget, guys. They have the beta lactamase um, gene, right? Also, the genes can also be transferred via um, plasmids, okay? So the beta lactamase gene is very transferable, then it's self reproducing, it's an extra chromosomal genetic material, and it can be transferred via your plasmids. All right. S. aureus. Does, do you think it has a beta lactamase, a staph aureus, a gram positive bacteria? Does it produce beta lactamase? No, it has altered, altered PBPs. Okay, uh, again, please. Sorry, it has altered PBPs. Yes. So does it produce beta-lactamase? Yes or no? Who's my no. microbiologist here? No. Yes. Okay, someone says yes. Why? Where? Where? Uh, what do you mean by where? So the staph aureus, gram-positive bacteria, it has beta-lactamase, right? Mm -hmm. So does it, is it in the periplasm or not in the periplasm? I don't know. Not in the period. Okay, okay. Maybe, maybe they didn't explain this to you well, guys. So here, here's the gist. If I, if I can remember it correctly. Uh, Beta-lactamase, right? In gram-negative bacteria, you can find the beta-lactamase in the periplasm. Remember the periplasmic space? You have the inner membrane here, the periplasmic space, the outer membrane, and then the lipopolysaccharide sticking on top, the LPS, right? So in gram-negative bacteria, the beta-lactamase is found in the periplasm. However, don't forget, gram-positives, they don't have the periplasm. That's a major difference between your gram-negative and gram-positive. So in organisms like Staph aureus, the beta-lactamase is secreted. That's the difference. That's what I'm trying to get at, okay? So we have beta-lactamase, right? Gram-negative bacteria and staph aureus can also produce that by secreting beta-lactamase. So what can we do as doctors to counteract 
that beta lactamase by the bacteria, what can we give? We can give beta lactamase inhibitors. High yield. Could you give me the name of the beta lactamase inhibitors? Clobinic acid. So, so go ahead. Solbactam and? Tazobactam and avibactam. Ooh, excellent. We have a pharmacologist here. Good job. It can be added to some penicillins to expand the coverage. For example, your anti staphylococcal penicillins, amino penicillins, don't forget little or no effect when used alone. When you use clavulanic acid alone, so bactam or isobactam alone, they don't have any effect. But if you combine them with an amino penicillin, you have a synergistic effect. Now, penicillin G and V, right? Look at the slide. Mechanism of action, we already talked about that. Clinical uses, narrow spectrum. We can use this for gram positives, strep pyogenes, or strep throat, and actinomyces Israeli, we can use it. I yield treponema pallidum for syphilis. We can use it, but rarely in susceptible isolates of um, Neisseria. Neisseria meningitides and strep um, pneumo. What's, what's, what's the common? Okay, Siri, not right now. <laughs> So what's the common adverse effect of your penicillin? Hypersensitivity reaction. Hypersensitivity reactions, right? First exposure, sensitization. Second exposure, hypersensitivity. The initial step, if the patient develop, develops this, what's the initial step in management? Stop the drug, okay? Look at the stem of the question. Initial step in management. Stop the drug, the symptoms will gonna be resolved. Let's talk about hypersensitivity. Uh, let's go back to term three for hypersensitivity. Type one, what is this? IgA, IgE, IgM, IgG, type one. IgE. IgE mediated, acute or chronic? Is it immediate or not immediate? Acute, of course, it is immediate. Type 1, IgE. So within one hour of taking the drug, they can have like an adverse reaction. What's the mechanism of action of type 1? It is IgE mediated. What is released in your mast cell? You have mast cell degranulation. The mast cell degranulates and it releases what? Histamine. Excellent, histamine granules. So what if I release histamine in my body? Itching, urticaria, bronchospasm, and the worst, anaphylaxis, okay? So where can we see this one? The maculopapular rash, right? Most common with your amino penicillins. It can be itchy or maybe non-pruritic. However, you don't have any fever, you don't have any wheezing, you don't have any joint um, pain. The maculopapular rash of penicillin is type 4, T-cell mediated mechanism. Okay, this is a non-immediate reaction. Contrast that one with the hypersensitivity or the allergic reaction. Another effect from maculopapular rash, give me a viral infection that can give you maculopapular rash. HHV5, what is it? CMV. Yeah. Epstein-Barr. Epstein-Barr, right? Yeah, EBV. So remember, am I, is it five or four? I'm sorry, guys. Four. Can someone check it for me? So four is EBV, five is CMV? Yeah, five is CMV. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So HHV4, um, right? So EBV is um, maculopapular rash, more common with viral infection, specifically EBV pharyngitis. So what can we give, guys? If someone presents with pharyngitis and a maculopapular rash, we can give amoxicillin for that one. Another adverse effect, Steven Johnson syndrome. 
toxic epidermal necrolysis. The difference between the two, TEN, more than 30% of body surface area. Another um, reaction is skin reactions. Immune-mediated, right? CD8 plays an important role. Can you give me other drugs aside from amino penicillins that can give you skin reactions? Of course, one that has beta-lactam rings like cephalosporins and your um, sulfonamides, your thermetoprime sulfamethoxazole. It can also give you skin reactions. Another high yield penicillin adverse effect. It's in there. Drug induced interstitial nephritis. Trivia, what's the mechanism of action? Anyone? The drug acts as blank. Term, uh, term, this is uh, term three. This is a term three term that um, Dr. Ramos loves to use. So it, the drug. Uh, the other one, the other one. You're there. Hapten, Hapten. Hapten. Okay. Hapten. Hapten. So the drug acts as a Hapten, and then you have an immune response in the kidneys. Interstitial nephritis is considered what type of hypersensitivity? Is it type 1, 2, 3, 4? What kind of um, hypersensitivity is in drug-induced interstitial nephritis? <clears throat> I know it's tricky. Again? Is it 3? I'm not sure. Careful, careful. This is not immune complex deposition. Um, clue, T-cell. T cell is involved. Type four, excellent. So type four hypersensitivity reaction for interstitial nephritis, guys. Okay, I know maybe this is like a fact, but don't forget it's a type four high yield hypersensitivity reaction. T cells and mast cells are involved. What are the presentations? How do you know that the patient is having drug induced interstitial nephritis? Fever, oliguria, increased BUN creatinine. What can we see in the urine? In interstitial nephritis, guys. What? WBC-CAS. Yeah, again? Come again, please. WBC-CAS. Excellent. WBC-CAS. What else? In terms of your agranulocytes, what can we see? Basophils. Can we see basophils? Uh, 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 there's the other one. That is elevated also in parasitic infections. Basophils. Excellent. There you go. Boom. You cinephils in urine and you have white cells and WBC casts. Another one here is, look, direct Coombs positive hemolytic anemia. So high doses of your penicillin, it can lead to extrinsic hemolytic anemia. Why? Again, the key word here is hapten. The penicillin, it binds to the surface RBCs, which elicits an immune response. Therefore, your body is producing antibodies against this penicillin bound to RBCs. That's why you have a positive direct Coombs test, meaning you have extrinsic hemolysis going on. Question, what type of hypersensitivity is this? Type 1, 2, 3, 4. Hemolytic anemia. Guys, come on. You know it. Say it. Two? Confidence. Of course it is type two. Of course it is type two. Antibody mediated, right? Don't forget those guys. All right. <clears throat> Another one. As I've said before, urticaria, fever, arthritis, lymphadenopathy. Those are your hypersensitivity um, reactions. Also, it's not here on the list, but I'm going to give it to you. Um, what is that? Serum sickness, serum sickness also is another adverse effect of penicillin. This is immune complex disorder, IgG, days two weeks after exposure. You have complement activation. Now, serum sickness for penicillin, right? What type of hypersensitivity reaction is this? Yes, excellent. You have an immune complex deposition. Let's um, summarize, okay? 
penicillin immunology. Penicillin, you have a lot of hypersensitivity reactions. Type 1, acute IgE anaphylaxis. Type 2, hemolysis, IgG. Type 3, serum sickness, IgG, fever, urticaria, arthritis. Type 4, T-cells, skin, interstitial nephritis. All right. Let's tie in penicillin, right? The patient has taken the course of the penicillin for a couple of weeks. Then suddenly, the patient develops diarrhea. Now, give me the organism that is responsible for the patient's diarrhea after antibiotic therapy. C. diff. Mm, good job. Excellent. C. diff, which can cause what? What is the term? It can cause? Pseudomembranous colitis. Ah, uh, good job. Pseudomembranous colitis. Now, that's... Um, when you think about pseudomembranous colitis, always associated, always associated with what? Uh, what drug? What drug can cause um, pseudomembranous? Thindamycin. Excellent, thindamycin. Is that the only one? No, there's another one. What's another one? Ampicillin. So one of one of your penicillins, yes. Um, I'm thinking about a rupture of the tendon. Fluoroquinolones. Ah, oh, excellent. Fluoroquinolones. Another one. Close cousin to your penicillin. Think about um. Amoxicillin. Uh, again, please. Amoxicillin. Yes, but I'm thinking about. Cephalosporins. Excellent. Good job, cephalosporins. So. When you think pseudomembranous so colitis, right? Think about clindamycin, that's number one. But not only clinda, also fluoroquinolones, cephalosporins, and penicillins. Okay, guys, I don't know if you know this. Um, a patient has spirochete infections, syphilis. You give penicillin. Suddenly, the patient is having febrile syndromes, fevers, chills, two hours after starting the penicillin therapy. What do we call this reaction? Jarish has Herx, Jarish Herx Lexer, something like that. Okay, <laughs> good attempt, good attempt, excellent. So this is your Jarish Herxheimer reaction. What causes this reaction? Why do we have a sudden febrile syndrome? What's the mechanism? Why are we having this reaction? Is it? I don't recall. If it, is it due to the fact that there's like a mass um, clean of the bacteria, and so it's releasing the endotoxins? Excellent. Good job. So your spirochetes, they're dying, right? So they're dying. You have a bacterial death, a massive load in the body of spirochetes dying, and they're releasing these um, toxins. Thereby, your body is just having an immune reaction to that okay don't forget that one guys that's um high um yield okay now we're talking about penicillinase sensitive penicillins your amoxicillin ampicillin these are called amino penicillins high yield mechanism of action of your amino penicillins penetrate pouring channel of gram negative bacteria sensitive to beta lactamase enzyme. Your amoxicillin and, and ampicillin, commonly used, what's the main clinical use of your amino penicillins? For amoxicillin, like an animal bite? <clears throat> it can be, yeah, yes, yes. But the main clinical uses of your amino penicillin. Okay, bacterial sinusitis, okay. What else? Meningitis, newborns, elderly. Also, it can provide hysteria coverage, right, in the elderly. What else? Otitis, externa, media, interna? Media. Media, excellent. And the bacteria that's commonly treated by your um, amino penicillin. 
E. coli, um, what else? Proteins of hysteria, which is gram positive, gram negative. Gram positive, don't forget. What else? Shigella. Um, I think salmonella also, and um, H. influenza. Okay, those are the things that aminosilins can <clears throat> attack, right? So, as I've said before, what can we see? Adverse effect, high yield. You can also have a maculo, um, papular rash, again, skin um, reactions, right? Now, let's talk about this um, diclofloxacin, nafcin, oxacillin. So this is for um, S or use infection, except MRSA, okay? So remember the mnemonic, use NAF for STA, all right? Why can't um, nafcillin be used for MRSA? Because MRSA has an altered PBP target site, so it doesn't work. In terms of your anti-pseudomonal, all right? Um, so anti um, staphylococcal, for example, your nafcillin and um, oxacillin. So the, chi the side chain of these drugs, your beta, it protects the beta lactam from your staph um, penicillinase. All right, it covers staph aureus, non MRSA, as I've said, and most strep for these. Um, common uses for your um, oxacillin, nafcillin, and diclo. That sorry, dicloxacillin. Can you give me some common uses for this? Um, like skin infection of staph epidermis. Excellent. Staph, good. So common um community acquired cellulitis. What else? Honey crusted lesions on the mouth. Honey crusted lesions. Oh, so go. And pentigo, don't forget that one. What else? Staph endocarditis also. Side effects are just similar to your penicillins. Now, another high yield, anti -sodomonal. You need to know the names, okay? For all of these drugs, know the class of drugs, specific examples of each of them, mechanism of action, clinical use, and side effects. Those are the high yield points. So for anti penicillins, what's the mechanism of action? of this drugs, your, your piperacillin and ticarcillin. High yield. Anyone? Remember those porins? So these drugs attack the porin channels. You have a greater porin channel penetration. So it opens up your um, porins. It's effective against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. More gram-negative coverage versus your amino penicillins. Question. These drugs, your anti-pseudomonal penicillins, are they susceptible to beta-lactamase? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, they're gram-negatives. All <laughs> right. So we can give it can be given with a beta lactamase inhibitors. So in the hospital, commonly seen a zosin. Zosin, when you go to rotations, this is piprazilin tazobactam, basically, commonly given. Um, these drugs are also broad spectrum, right? More gram negative than gram positive, right? Commonly given in hospitalized patients like with sepsis. You can see this one. Zosin, don't forget. Pyrpracillin, Thazo, Bactams. We talk about beta lactamase um, inhibitors. Cephalos um, forins. Cephalos forins. So these are beta lactam drugs that inhibit cell wall synthesis. This is interesting. You need to know the generation of the cephalosporins and examples of each. So we have one to four generation. First generation, think cephazolin, cephalexin, mostly gram positive coverage. So when we go from ge first generation to fourth generation, we have an increase in gram negative coverage. Okay, that's clear. 
gen first generation, mostly gram positive. As we go from generation uno to generation cuatro, we are increasing the gram negative coverage. So first generation cephalosporins. Let's go. We need to know the examples. Cephazolin, cephalexin. This is developed, why? To treat staph aureus resistance to penicillin. It covers many gram positive, including staph aureus, but not MRSA. Does it cover enterococcus or listeria, do you think? If it covers um, gram positive, yes or no? Does it cover enterococcus, careful, or listeria? No, how, unfortunately, it does not cover enterococcus or listeria. Main uses for first generation cephalosporins. What's the main use, the clinical use for your first generation? Surgical. Skin, abscess, of course. Surgical wound, right? Skin infections. And um, when you go to the hospital, the cefazolin, it is usually given um, pre-op right, for prevention of surgical wound um, infection. Second generation cephalosporin. Know the names. Cefuroxim, cefoxit, Tin, cefotitan. So these are developed to treat amoxicillin-resistant infections. They are more resistant to beta-lactamase. Now you have increased gram-negative coverage. Therefore, there are what organisms is sensitive then to second-generation cephalosporins? G give me gram-negatives. Gram-negatives. Asian so, influenza. Asian influenza. What else? Proteus, E. coli, Klebsiella, Serratia, uh, Neisseria, gonorrhea. Also, don't forget, this has increased anaerobic coverage, right? Bacteroides. Okay, don't forget that. Also, cefuroxime is oral, PO. While cefoxitin, my God, cefotitan, they are IV. Cefuroxime, commonly given in, what is this? Otitis media, right? Due to strep pneumo or H influenza. And also UTI in children, right? E. coli. Please, guys, do not give fluoroquinolones in children. Okay, doctors? Cefotitan and cefoxetine, IV, it covers PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. So it covers Neisseria. You have a coverage for um, Neisseria. Also, please, doctors, give doxycycline for chlamydia, okay? Also, this drug um, can be used, um, I'm blanking, pre-op in children with appendicitis. So if, if kids have appendicitis, you know, the most common organism is um, E. coli. So you give this drug, it covers your gram negatives and some anaerobes, usually given with metronidazole for this. Next, third generation. I think third generation is the highest yield of them all, of all the cephalosporins. Your ceftriaxone, cefotaxime, and ceftazidine. You have a broad gram-negative coverage. Again, it, ceftazidine is the one that covers pseudomonas. High yield, don't forget that. Ceftazidine is the only one that covers pseudomonas. Your ceftriaxone and cefotaxime, they have poor coverage for pseudomonas. So your ceftazidine is used in hospitalized patients with gram-negative infections, also with sepsis and pneumonia. And guess what? Third-generation cephalosporins, they achieve good CSF penetration. Therefore, they can be used for meningitis. Ceftriaxone, let's go for this. Commonly used for Neisseria gonorrhea, used in meningitis. Um, as I've said, good CSF penetration. For fourth generation cephalosporin, you only need to know cefepime. This is broad spectrum, right? And methicillin sensitive stuff, aureus, commonly used in gram positives, gram negatives, including pseudomonas. So cefepime can be used for pseudomonas. And um, basically, this is used in patients, hospitalized patients with gram negative infections. Okay? So let's. Fifth generation cephalosporins, then we can summarize this based on beta lactamase sensitivity. 
Okay? Fifth generation, one drug, ceftarolin. Why is this important? This is the only cephalosporin that's active against MRSA. Okay? It has been approved only in 2010. It's been in the market for 10 years. It binds to PBP2A. Okay? It covers MRSA and VERSA. MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus. VERSA, vancomycin-resistant staph aureus. Some negatives also. So that's your fifth generation cephalosporins. <clears throat> All right. I want you to imagine a line. All right. We're talking about the beta lactamase sensitivity. It's the, the side chain, right? More sensitive here and resistant um, here. So what are we going to give if they are um, sensitive to beta lactamase? We can give penicillin, right? On the left hand side, sensitive. On the right hand side, resistant. Imagine a line, a plot line. On the left side, you have sensitive. On the right side, you have resistant. If they are beta lactamase sensitive, give penicillin. Then we're moving from left to right. You can give first generation cephalosporin, second, third, fourth. What if they're resistant then? What can we get after the fourth cephalosporin? You can give astronam only if the organisms are gram negative, right? And if they are resistant to all of them, the last one that you can give is the carbapenems, your imipenem, your meropenem, okay? Those are high yield guys. Now, another high yield point. Resistant mechanism to cephalosporins. How does the bacteria acquire resistant mechanisms? Anyone? <clears throat> How does the bacteria rec um, acquire resistance to cephalosporins? They modify the PVP target. Good. Excellent. What else? Beta lactamase, and they alter cell permeability side effects don't forget similar to penicillin you have hypersensitivity reactions right uh, in in the literature it says it has like 10 percent cross reactivity with penicillin but in real life the risk is actually lower <clears throat> give me a vitamin deficiency associated with cephalosporin okay <clears throat> Excellent, vitamin K deficiency, right? Why? Why does the patient have an increased risk for a vitamin K deficiency if they're taking cephalosporin? Because? Does it have to do with um, E. coli? Because, good, good. The Why? Methyl, methyl thiol Why? group. Because the antibiotics, they reduce the gut flora. They reduce the bacterial vitamin K production. How does vitamin K produce in the body? The bacteria metabolizes it. Okay? So, what's the result? You can have increased INR and potential bleeding for vitamin K deficiency. This is the problem for patients on warfarin. Okay? So, actually, vitamin K deficiency, any antibiotic that changes the microbiota of your um, gut flora, you can have increased risk, vitamin K deficiency. Another high yield for cephalosporins, adverse reaction is hypoprothrombinemia, commonly seen in like cefotetan or um, cefazolin, right? It's a mechanism of action, inhibits epoxide reductase. So you have a prolonged PT, INR. So what can you give? Vitamin K, vitamin K. And give a shot of vitamin K. Another adverse effect is nephrotoxicity of amino glycosides. So when you combine amino glycosides with cephalosporins, you can have nephrotoxicity. Okay, another one. Adverse effect of cephalosporin. They've taken cephalosporin, they went to the bar and drank alcohol. They now having warm, flushing, sweating. What do you call this reaction? Disulfiram reaction. Excellent, your disulfiram reaction. Mechanism of action? Why do you have this? I think like three of them specifically have that 
the methyl group that like causes the reaction? Why do you have so? Why do you have the sulforam reaction? Is it an and, inhibition uh, of the, the inhibition of what enzyme? Acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Therefore, if you inhibit that, what accumulates in the body? Acetaldehyde. Okay. So commonly seen the disulfiram reaction, not all cephalosporins, but commonly seen in um, cefamandol, um, cefotitan, and cepho whatever, cepho um, perazone, right? Good job. Okay, let's see what's next. Um, I have a question. Yes. Is, uh, should we uh, also think of like self trioxone is causing kernicterus? I wasn't sure about that. Can anyone check it for me, please? If it can develop. Yeah. Um, it, uh, what's it, the mechanism yes. of action of developing kernicterus? Um, our slides didn't specify. It just said self trioxone causes kernicterus. Okay, because it can be used for um, sepsis meningitis and um, ophthalmia. Yes. Hmm. I'm going to research that one. Precautions. It can cause kernicterus, right? Yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. It can increase the risk of bilirubin um, encephalopathy. Right. Excellent. Because it can induce hyperbilirubinemia. All right. Yeah. So... Let's look at, where are we now? Carbapenems, the last big gun, right? Do I need to know the names? Of course you need to know the names. <laughs> so, carbapenems. Are they penicillins? They are not penicillins, but they have a beta-lactam, right? They are resistant to cleavage by most beta-lactamase. <clears throat> so, carbapenems is the drug of choice for what? extended spectrum beta lactamase bacteria it's a, it has a broad spectrum this extended spectrum beta lactamase is found in um, bacterial enzymes and found in gram negative bacteria let's go back to term three examples of gram negative bacteria someone said pseudomonas what else Rebsiella. what else Enterobacteria. Enterobacter, what else? Salmonella, what else? Shigella, what else? Serratia. Okay, that's the only thing that I know. <laughs> so carbapenems, it's broad spectrum, gram positive, it can have gram negative, use in hospitalized patients. Now high yield out of all the carbapenems here. Imipenem. Imipenem is very, very special. Why? It's metabolized in the kidneys and it, it produces a metabolite that inhibits dehydropeptidase one in the proximal tubule, right? So what do you need to give doctors? If someone, you, 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 um, you prescribe someone with imipenem, what are you gonna give? Cislastin. Cislastin, high yield. This is the enzyme um, inhibitors, right? <clears throat> imipenem and meropenem, they are older. The newer ones are doripenem, and ertapenem. Ertapenem is um, once daily dosing. It has, however, weak activity against pseudomonas. Most common side effect, high yield, neurotoxicity, seizures. What's the mechanism of action? Why does it induce seizures? Inhibition of what receptor? Come on, guys. Why does carbapenem induce seizures? Neurotoxicity. It inhibits what? What receptor? Is it GABA receptors? Of course, it inhibits GABA receptors, right? Think about the mechanism of seizure, guys. So especially if your patient like has a renal failure and you're giving carbapenem or you're giving them a crazy amount of carbapenem. However, if you're worried about seizures, you can give your patient meropenem. Meropenem, high yield, it has the lowest um, risk of for your patient of developing seizures. Okay. Now, last but not the least, monobactams, your astrionam. Monobactam. Why is it called monobactam? Out of curiosity. Does anyone know? Why is it called the monobactam? There's only one ring. 
yeah, it's not fused, right? So if you look at the um, uh, structure of your penicillin and cephalosporin, your thiazolidone ring, right? And the side chains, they are um, fused. In this one, it, it's not. The beta-lactam lactam ring, it's not fused to another ring. High yield. What's the mechanism of action of your astrionam? It binds to what? PBP, of course, penicillin binding protein 3, found in gram-negative bacteria. So it prevents cross-linking of peptidoglycan. Bacteriostatic or bactericidal? If it prevents cross-linking of peptidoglycan, is it bactericidal or bacteriostatic? Cidal. Bactericidal, of course. However, guys, unfortunately, this has limited susceptibility to beta lactamase. It is only active against gram negative bacteria. So the question is if the patient has an altered binding protein of gram positive bacteria, do not give astronam. It is only active in um, PBPs of gram-negative bacteria. Right? However, astronam is active against pseudomonas. <clears throat> okay? Commonly be given like IV. If you give astronam with aminoglycosides, it has a synergistic effect. Don't forget, it doesn't have any cross-reactivity to penicillin. So this can be used if the patient is allergic to penicillin. Okay, that's high yield. Right, you're good to go? We're good so far? Yes. Yeah? Yes. yes. No? I know, guys, I know. Okay, vanc vancomycin. So vancomycin. Can someone tell me what's the mechanism of action of vancomycin? What is this? <clears throat> Did anyone watch Sketchy, Sketchy Farm? Please watch them. It's very helpful. I think it binds directly to the Diala Diala portion. So exactly. it inhibits. Exactly. Good job. So it inhibits your cell wall peptidoglycan um, formation via what mechanism? By binding to your DALA, DALA portion of the cell wall. Clinical use, gram-positive bugs only, including MRSA, S. epidermides, and all of those. Crab, look at this man here. What is he having? We call it the red man syndrome, right? Other side effects of bank high yield, nephrotoxicity, autotoxicity, don't combine this with a diuretic, your loop diuretics, or cisplatin, thrombophlebitis, and diffuse um, flushing. What's the mechanism of resistance? If they modify the DALA, DALA2, DALA, and D lactate, that's the mechanism of resistance to your vancomycin. All right, we're good so far. Yes? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Protein synthesis inhibitors. All right, let's summarize this one. How does the bacteria synthesize proteins? What's the central dogma of DNA? DNA, transcription to RNA. RNA polymerase is there. So this is the target of your rifampin, don't forget, for um, the drug for TB. RNA translated to protein. Now we're synthesizing the protein. You have the 50S, 50S here on top, 30S, they come together, boop. This is the mRNA in the middle, boop. They come um, together. Initiation process of these. Give me a drug that inhibits the initiation process of the combination of your 50 and 30S. A drugs, a class of drug that inhibits the initiate initiation process of your uh, bacterial protein synthesis. High yield. Linezolid. Good job, linezolid. There's another one. Don't forget the other one. 
Maisin, maisin. Maisin, maisin. Aminoglycosides. Okay? Next, another high yield point. The addition of your tRNA. Give me a drug that inhibits that. Cuatro. Tetracyclines. Excellent, tetracycline. Another one, you inhibit um, the translocation and the addition of peptides. Give me the drugs that inhibits that. High yield. Macrolides. Mac, excellent. Another one. Mycin. Clindamycin. Excellent. Another one. Chloramphenicol. Ah, good job. Good job. Chloramphenicol. Let's summarize, okay? Initiate, initiating process, drugs, aminoglycosides, linazolid. Addition of tRNA, drug, tetracycline. Addition of peptides and trans, um, translocate, macrolides, chloramphenicol, and clinda, mycin. Don't forget this one, guys. The 30S inhibitors and the 50S inhibitors. These are high yield. Buy at 30, sell at 50. Now, let's look at aminoglycosides. Know the names, it ends in mycin, okay? It blocks initiation of your protein um, synthesis. Is this effective against anaerobes, do you think? Is this effective against anaerobic bacteria, your aminoglycosides? So if it, it blocks the initiation of the protein synthesis, it binds to the 30S, right? which causes the misreading of your genetic code. So but the bacteria cannot produce like cellular protein cell death. Yes, it's bactericidal. But my question is, is this effective against anaerobes? No, because it needs oxygen. Excellent. Does it affect um, eukaryotic cells? Eukaryotic cells? No. no. Of course not. If, if, if it does, we're all gonna be dead right now. Why? Different ribosomes, they don't have 30S, right? <laughs> Can this be transferred into eukaryotic cell? No. Is it effective against rickettsia and chlamydia? Your intracellular organisms, yes or no? Aminoglycosides. Is it effective against intracellular organisms like rickettsia and chlamydia? No, of course not. What can you give for rickettsia and chlamydia? Doxycycline, right? Your tetracyclines. <sighs> All right. Do we use them alone? Uh, rarely to treat um, gram negative. Oh, in the olden days, guys, the streptomycin actually is used for tuberculosis. Okay. But now it is not used as a monotherapy, it's an older agent like myself. <laughs> Don't forget that neomycin. It is given prior to bowel um, surgery. So usually we give like neomycin and um, erythromycin for this. All right. Resistance, high yield. What's the most common mechanism of resistance? Your amino glycosides. Anyone? Is it like acetylation? Um... Acetylation of, so you just modify the ribosome, basically, right? So phosphorylation, you can have adenylation and acetylation. High yield, side effects, autotoxicity, right? What cranial nerve is it, is affected? Eight. Eight. Ocho, excellent. So hearing loss, balance um, problems. Give me a neuro disorder that affects the eighth cranial nerve bilaterally. You can have schwannoma bilateral, um, a schwannoma. You can have some fibromas in the skin. There you go. I said it. Neurofibromatosis 2, NF2, bilateral um, schwannomas. It is also nephrotoxic, so you can have acute tubular um, necro necrosis, classic cast in acute tubular necrosis. In ATN, acute tubular necrosis. Muddy but brown casts? Of course, yes, muddy brown cast for that one, right? 
be careful the serum creatinine, which is, this is the measure for kidney function. We use BUN, yes, but creatinine is the main one, right? It will rise. Another side effect, neuromuscular blockade. So it can block the release of acetylcholine. And of course, this is pregnancy class D. So there's some um, studies that says the fetus has a renal and renal function decline and autotoxicity for this. So what do we need to monitor? We need to monitor the levels for aminoglycosides to prevent toxicity. Good job. Next, tetracyclines. So these are the tetracycline, doxycycline, and minocycline. It binds to high yield 30S, right? It prevents attachment of the TRNA. Out of curiosity, guys. Um, it's an older drug given in SIADH. It's an ADH antagonist. Like the meclocycline. Don't forget that one. The meclocycline. This is the prototypical drug that was used to design your tetracyclines. It's the, the meclocycline. Um, so let's look at specific ones. Doxycycline. This is the most common. You can see this one in the hospital. It accumulates intracellularly and... It is used to treat acne vulgaris. Don't forget that. Also minoxycycline. Why it covers? What's the organism that causes acne? What's the organism that causes acne? Causes what? What organism causes acne vulgaris? I think it's a propioni bacterium. Excellent, of course. It is propionobacterium um, acnes, okay? High yield for tetracyclines. Impaired absorption of what minerals? Tell me. What minerals? Calcium, magnesium, iron. High yield, okay? These substances, they are cations that chelate the drugs. So, tell the patient. If you're giving tetracyclines, don't take it with antacids or milk because it reduces the absorption of calcium, magnesium, and iron. So what's the mechanism of resistance for tetracyclines? Decrease influx or efflux from cells also by um, plasma encoded transport pumps. Adverse effect, the most common is GI distress. You can also have photosensitivity, discoloration of teeth, inhibition of bone growth, and high yield pregnancy category X. This is contraindicated in pregnancy. Take a cycling, not that important. Lorem phenicol, high yield mechanism of action binds to 50S ribosome, inhibits peptidyl transferase, Rarely used in the developed world because of toxicity and increasing resistance. However, in developing countries, this is commonly used due to low cost. Loramphenicol has a broad coverage, let's see, of gram positive and gram negative and some atypicals. Can this be used in pregnancy? Loramphenicol, is it safe in pregnancy? Yes? No. Because of the gray baby syndrome? Uh, it, it can induce um, gray baby syndrome, right? But this can be used in pregnancy instead of your um, doxycycline. However, you're right. There is an increased risk of gray baby syndrome. But on the third trimester, though, so you can use chloramphenicol for rickettsia and um, ehrlichia in the first and second trimester. So there's a caveat. Okay, first and second trimester, yes. Third trimester, no, because of the risk of gray baby syndrome. Chloramphenicol is used in the developing world for meningitis. It covers Neisseria. And however, unfortunately, this is less effective than the alternative drugs. What's the side effect? Anemia, aplastic anemia, gray baby syndrome. Someone said it. Mechanism of action, why? Why does it induce gray baby syndrome? Anyone? 
Why? Is it because of the anemia? Anemia usually is due to bone marrow um, suppression. The baby doesn't have, oh, sorry, the baby doesn't have the enzyme to metabolize it, and then it, it crosses the CNS. And Let's go back to term two. What is that enzyme? Doesn't that accumulate in the body? Like what's the enzyme that the baby slaps? Okay, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, just glucuronic acid. UDP, glucuronyl transferase, which conjugates your bilirubin in the liver. Remember, from unconjugated bilirubin, that enzyme now it's conjugated. Bilirubin it can go to stercobilin. Stercobilinogen, urobilinogen, then all of those good stuff. So the babies lack them, right? And this enzyme is required for metabolism of chloramphenicol so that it can be excreted. Therefore, the level of um, um, the skin turns ashen or gray. That's why it's called gray baby syndrome and hypotension. And unfortunately, this is very, very fatal. As I've said, that's chloramphenicol. Let's talk about clindamycin, clinda high yield 50S ribosome. So this is the same mechanism of action as what? Another class of drug that binds to the 50S ribosome, specifically, they're going to say 23S um, rRNA, whatever, component. Macrolide. Right? Macrolides, excellent. Your erythromycins, it covers some gram-positive. Right? It also covers anaerobe. Tell me, guys, the anaerobic organisms. Go. That you know. Anaerobic. Clostridium. Clostridium. All of the clostridium species. What else? Mouth. Bacteroides. Bacteroides in the gut. That's in the gut. What else? Fusobacterium. Prevotella. Um, Pepto, not pepto bismol, of course, pepto streptococcus. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's that time of the day, right? So, again, I know we've heard the, mnemon the mnemonic. Clean the mycin above the diaphragm. What's below the diaphragm? Metronidazole. Metronidazole, excellent. So, if it's above the diaphragm, what are the pathology that we can, we can imagine to use clean the mycin? If it's above a diaphragm, think of pathology that we can use clindamycin for. Aspiration pneumonia, they're alcoholic, right? What else? Lung abscess and oral infections, right? Adverse effect of clindamycin, again, don't forget C. diff, so the membranous colitis. And also some antibiotic associated diarrhea, as expected. Why? You're changing the gut flora, the microbiome. Linazolid, high yield, binds to 50S ribosome. What's the main use for linazolid? Bonus points. Who can tell me? The main use of linazolid. Versa. Careful. What's the main use of linazolid? Endocarditis, if they're like vancomycin resistant. Um, good job. You said the word. However, I'm looking for VREs. Uh, vancomycin resistant enterococcus. This is common in hospitals, guys, right? So if the patient has a prior antibiotic um, um, treatment, and now the patient develops like VRE. We've used a bank too much in this patient and his body. The patient's body has become desensitized to so vancomycin, so we need to use linazolid. Someone said it during the discussion of the psychiatric drug that linazolid is a weak monoamine oxidase inhibitor, high yield, don't forget that. So it can cause what? Serotonin syndrome. So high risk when we give SSRIs, all right? All right. Let's talk about macro lines. Do I need to know the names? Of course, you need to know the names. Azithromycin, clarithromycin, all of those good stuff. High yield, 
It blocks translocation, 50S ribosomes. Uh, common, it covers many gram positive, but some gram negative. However, this is much more important. It is effective against intracellular organisms. So if your patient has chlamydia, right, remember it's an obligate, right? Anaerobe, legionella, facultative, anaerobe. It is effective. You can give macronides. Another one is um, community acquired pneumonia. Why? It covers strep, it covers H flu, it covers atypical, your mycoplasma. Good for penicillin allergic patients. It is also good for chlamydia infection. However, if the patient is pregnant, what can we give? We can give macrolides, right? azithromycin specifically. If the patient has a co-infection with gonorrhea, which is usually, right? Chlamydia and gonorrhea, they go, you know, together. Like um, hep B and hep D, they go together. So macrolides are often co-administered with ceftriaxone for your gonorrhea. All right, don't forget erythromycin is used in Let's think of an endocrine disorder that erythromycin is commonly used for. An endocrine disorder, it's an epidemic in America. Anyone? Erythromycin. Erythromycin is used for Am I just talking to myself? Or? Hello? I'm not sure. Endocrine clue, type 2, diabetes. Clue, GI tract. Diabetic patients usually have this one. Obesity. Gastroparesis. Oh, excellent. There you go. So erythromycin. Remember in diabetics, they have diabetic gastroparesis, right? Don't forget that, guys. So erythromycin, it binds to the motilin receptors in the GI tract. Remember motilin? What's the mechanism of action? Term two, right? What's motilin? What's the function of motilin in the body? It stimulates smooth muscle. GI contraction, of course, right? So it can be used in GI motility disorders. Okay, another question for you guys. Clarithromycin used in what? Travelers. <clears throat> you need the clue? Peptic ulcer disease. Helicobacter? X. H. pylori, H. Yes, clarithromycin, the triple therapy, right? Don't forget, clarithromycin is a part of a triple therapy for H. pylori. Another high yield point. How does the organism require resistance to macrolide? What's the mechanism of resistance? So they modify the 23-SRRNA, right? They are methylating this site, which confers resistant. This is the location of the binding of your macrolides, okay? So if you think about this one, if you know the mechanism of action, you already know the resistance mechanism, all right? So please remember those. Side effects, of course, nausea, diarrhea, abdominal pain, high yield. Erythromycin is the worst out of all the macrolides in prolonging the QT interval on EKG, there's something in the liver that it induces. Um, cholestatic, sorry, cholestatic um, hepatitis, commonly seen in patients taking um, azithromycin, commonly seen in patients in azithromycin. So if you know that it induces cholestatic hepatitis, don't give macrolides to what kind of patients? 
Uh, Don't okay. give it. Liver failure, please. Excellent, liver failure. Yeah, yeah. History of cholestatic jaundice, or if they have something like hepatic dysfunction, alcoholic hepatitis, or non-fatty alcoholic um, liver um, disease, right? Also, don't forget rash for macrolides and P450 enzyme inhibitors, okay? It will raise the level of your warfarin and your theophylline, okay? Good job. Polymyxins, these are the newer ones, right? Um, what's high yield here? Okay, don't forget that polymyxin B is a um, triple antibiotic used for superficial skin infections. And note of the adverse effects. We're good so far, guys? Yes. So far, so good. Just tell me, okay? All right. Sulfonamides. Sulfonamides, in terms of the structure, they have a SO2N, right? That's why they're called sulfa drugs. They contain sulfonamide group. Let's go back to term two, all right? Bacterial folate synthesis. So folate is required for your DNA synthesis. What's the enzyme that converts PABA and pteridine to dihydropeptor? Oh, sorry, dihydro um, dihydropteroic acid, DHA. <laughs> so remember how does the bacteria synthesize? Um, Folate, you have PABA, that's a precursor. Your para-aminobenzoic acid, combine it with pteridine to form dihydropteroic acid. What's the enzyme there? We call that dihydropteroid synthase. What is the drug that inhibits that enzyme? Sulfonamides. Okay? Clear. Hydro, hydropteroic acid is converted to dihydrofolic acid, then to tetrahydro. Folic acid by what enzyme? Dihydrofolate reaction. Those two reactions, they're catalyzed by your dihydrofolate reductase. What drug inhibits that, um, those two reactions? Trimetoprime, right? There's another one, pyrimethamine, okay? So let's summarize. Look at the, um, what do they call this one? The pathways on the right, all right? So, dihydropteroid synthase, drug that inhibits that is the sulfonamides and also dapsone. For dihydrofolate reductase, the drug that inhibits that is trimethoprim and pyrimethamine. So, sulfonamides actually, they mimic the PABA receptor, the uh, sorry, PABA precursor molecule, right? They competitively inhibit your dihydropteroid um, synthase. How does um, the bacteria require resistance to sulfas? Increase PABA and out they alter the dihydropteroid synthase. Dapsone, is it is this a sulfonamide? Dapsone? No, it's not a it's not a it's not a sulfonamide, right? It doesn't have the SO2N group. However, dapsone it competes with PABA for dihydropteroid um, synthase. Um, give me the pathology. Um, dapsone can be used in what pathology? Um, what pathology? What condition? Malaria. Dapsone. Tuberculosis. What kind? Tuberculosis for dapsone. Um, careful, guys. Dapsone is um, leprosy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And there's another one, pneumocystis gerobecchi. Dapsone can be used for that one um, also, right? So why can't we just give them alone? Why, why should they be together, right? So usually given with trimethoprim. It's, not, it's never alone. It's never um, trimethoprim alone or sulfamethoxazole alone. They are usually combined. Why? So you can have sequential blocking of your THF synthesis. So you block them at the source and you block them in the downstream reactions. Okay. Another example of sulfonamides that you can have are um, sulfadiazine. This is like a cream for burn patients. And also 
um, sulfadiazine and pyrimethamine. Tell me the pathology. What can we use these two drugs for? Sulfadiazine and pyrimethamine. Clue? Ring enhancing lesions. Toxoplasmosis. Oh, there you go. Toxoplasmosis and HIV patients. Be careful, however, guys, when you prescribe this. So hypersensitive reactions can um, occur. Um, if anyone of you is interested in um, research, we have the aryl amine at the N4 position of the nitrogen ring, which attached to the N1 nitrogen. There are different reactions there. That's the main cause of your hypersensitivity. Um, other sulfa drugs that are examples of other sulfa drugs. Can you give me, aside from um, sulfa methoxazole, sulfa diazine, can you give me other kinds of drugs that has the um, SO2N, the sulfonamide group in it? Is it pro probenicin? No. Excellent, good job. Use for what? Doubt? Uh, was yeah. What Gout. else? What else? And um, it's for H, like antiviral. It helps um, decrease the secretion of. Yeah. So other drugs for benefit for gout. What else? Other drugs that are um, sulfa, that has a sulfa group. Aside from probenicid, furosemide, your loop diuretic, right? Another one. Another diuretic. Hydrochlorothiazide, hydrochlorothiazide diuretics. Careful with that, why? Hypergluc, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, hyperuricemia, hypercalcemia. So commonly you, you can give um, hydrochlorothiazide for um, patients that have osteoporosis. Another drug, mountain sickness. Acetazolamide. Oh, good job. Mechanism of action of acetazolamide. It inhibits what? The bi bicarb secretion or no? What enzyme? Carbonic anhydrous inhibitors. Good. Another drug. Diabetes. Diabetes. Don't forget. Sulfonarias. Oh, good job. Sulfonar. Excellent. And there's another one, inflammatory bowel. Inflammatory bowel disease. Sulfasalazines. Oh, excellent. Bingo. There you go. So we need to know the allergic reactions. Again, hypersensitivity. Steven Johnson, T-E-N, photosensitivity. Tell them to wear sunscreen when they go out, right? Common drugs, sulfonamides, also tetracyclines. They, they need to wear sunscreen when they go out. And amiodarone. Don't forget that. Sulfonamides can induce hemolysis in what kind of patients? People with G6PD. G6PD deficiency. You have patients. Other triggers other than sulfonamides is dapsone. So... Um, sulfonamide binds to albumin, so it can displace bilirubin and warfarin. Someone said it, um, sulfonamides can cause kernicterus in um, infants. You have an increased free bilirubin levels. Therefore, you have an increased levels of your unconjugated um, bilirubin. Is this deadly, life-threatening? Yes, of course. Why? Permanent neurological impairment for the infant. Again, sulfonamides, they, it raises the warfarin levels. So you need to follow uh, PTINR. Trimethoprim and um, pyrimethamine, they inhibit dihydrofolate um, reductase. Um, okay, high yield toxicity with trimethoprim and pyrimethamine. You now have bone marrow suppression. Right, you have megaloblastic anemia, you have leukopenia, decreased platelets. What can you give doctors? Someone who has now developed bone marrow suppression in taking trimethoprim and pyrimethamine. What can we give doctors? Levocorin. 
Excellent, Leucovorin. This is your folinic um, acid. Why is this um, helpful? It does not increase. Require, I think. This can be directly, this drug can be directly converted to tetra um, hydrofolic acid. It doesn't need the intermediate step. It doesn't need a dihydrofolic reductase. It can specifically become THF. Okay. All right. So if you combine them, like Voltes 5, right? Trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole, you combine them, we call it Bactrim. It is bactericidal now. However, risk of carnicterus and it disrupts folic acid metabolism. Don't forget um, PCP. The treatment of choice is trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole. If they're resistant to um, Bactrim, you can give Dapsone. You can also give, someone said it, a malarial drug, atobacone and um, pentamidine. You could also do that one. All right, we're good so far? Yes. Let's continue. Yes. Okay, um, let's go to your... Before we continue, I have a question for you guys. Now, make a list, a drug list. Tell me which drugs are, but, okay, I'm gonna tell you the um, antibiotic class. Then you tell me if it's bacteriostatic or bactericidal, okay? Is that, is that good? Okay. Um, linazolid. Bacteriostatic or bactericidal? Linazolid. Bactericidal. Careful, careful. Mostly bacteriostatic for the nasal. Macrolide. Macrolide, erythromycin. Bacteriostatic or bactericidal? This is high yield, guys. Bacteriostatic. Excellent. Next, um, chloramphenicol. Static. Static. Um, gentamicin, amikacin, um, your, uh, what do you call this one? Aminoglycosides. Cidal. Cidal. So what's, what, what's our, how can we know if this class of drugs are bactericidal or bacteriostatic? So most protein synthesis inhibitors, they are bacteriostatic. Okay, that's our guiding um, principle. Only amino glycosides are bactericidal. Okay, so that's 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 it basically. So most highlight the word most most protein synthesis inhibitors are bacteriostatic. Only amino glycosides are bactericidal. Fluoroquinolones. Oh, what what's going on here? Fluoroquinolones, high yield. They inhibit DNA gyrase. Right? Thereby inhibiting DNA synthesis. Also, they inhibit topoisomerase. Cuatro. DNA um, gyrase, if I remember correctly, it um, introduces a double stranded break, right? Your topoisomerase for it, and then it repairs the um, break. So, if you inhibit this one, you can have DNA damage, thereby causing cell death. So what's the resistant mechanism for the quinolones? Of course, the organism will gonna alter DNA gyrase and topoisomerase for effective in gram positive and gram negative and some atypicals. Also, some gram positive coverage, but very good gram negative though, okay? Also, for pseudomonas, quinolones is good, all right? Um, using UTI, GI infections, okay? Remember the Cipro, Ciprofloxacin, they have an eardrops for um, otitis. Gabofloxacin is used um, for, it has a better strep coverage, strep pneumo, 
coverage than your um, Cipro and also MSSA, methicillin susceptible staph um, aureus. You can use that one. However, levofloxacine is um, less effective against some um, pseudomonas than Cipro. Commonly used in pneumonia, your strep pneumonia and your um, atypical pneumonia. Quinolones, adverse reactions, GI basically, GI ap upset. And of course, neurologic side effects, headache, dizziness. Again, high yield. Aside from your macrolides, quinolones can have QT prolongation on your EKG. Question, guys. So what if I have increased QT prolongation? So what if my QT is prolonged on EKG? Is that bad? It could yes. increase the chance of Tursad's day point. Ex excellent, Tursad's day point. How can we know on an EKG that someone has Tursad's? You have the twisting, right? It looks like, um, let me go this one. If, if, if you can see me um, demonstrating, like a twisting of the points, right? What can we give? And someone. Magnesium. Excellent. IV magnesium. All right. Another adverse reaction is tendon rupture, tendonitis. Specifically, if the patient is taking steroids and taking fluoroquinolones. Do not give this to pregnant women or children. Why? This is toxic to developing cartilage. So don't ever give this. Also, antacids, tell your patient, don't take antacids. If your patient is taking tetracycline, fluoroquinolones, um, isoniazid, iron supplements, don't take um, antacids because it can disrupt the absorption of your fluoroquinolones. Daptomycin. So uh, fluoroquinolones are bactericidal. And someone confirmed that um, to me, fluoroquinolones are bactericidal. Yeah, that's what it says in the uh, first aid. It does. Yes. Yep, it does. So where are we now? Daptomycin, um, what's high yield here? Staph aureus skin infection, MRSA. Okay, we can use DAPTO for MRSA. Um, that's it, I think. Metronidazole, of course. Mm. What is this? Uh, metronidazole below, below the diaphragm. Okay, so the mechanism of action for this metronidazole actually it's a pro drug. So you need the anaerobic bacteria for this to work, okay? So the anaerobic bacteria, it's like your, um, what do you call that? In, um, in your AIDS drug, your SNRIs. So it, it needs, the, uh, for this one, it needs the bacteria itself. It reduces the drug so that you can have more drug uptake to activate the drug. Then the drug interacts with DNA, it intercalates in there, it breaks it, it's, it destabilizes it thereby, causing cell death, common in bacteroides, fragilis, and clostridium, difficile. What's the use? H. pylori and Gardnerella vaginalis. What kind of discharge can we see in Gardnerella? What kind of discharge in Gardnerella? Ice. Yellow, green. Yellow, green? Is it clear? White? It's not trichomoniasis, right? Exactly. It is white. Why? You have fishy odor, right? Um, this is like um, very common. You're, uh, this is bacterial um, vaginosis, right? Okay. I think greenest discharge is trichomonas, trichomoniasis. If I remember it correctly. Don't forget metronidazole. Triple therapy for H. pylori. Don't forget that one. Is, is Can we use metronidazole for protozoa, your protozoal infection? C or no? 
Yeah. See, why? Because they lack mitochondria, right? Anaerobic protozoa, well, they don't have any mitochondria. So might as well, we, we might use metronidazole. Examples of anaerobic protozoa. I've said it already. Trichomonas, vaginalis, another one. Oh my God, beetle um, diarrhea. It can cause malabsorption syndrome. It can cause um, fat in the stool. Hiking. They went into hiking. They drank water. Giardia. 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 Exactly. It's an anaerobic protozoa. You don't have mitochondria. Another one. Um, uh, water. Um, and then they develop liver cyst due to drinking contaminated water. Entamoeba. Entamoeba. Good job, guys. Yes, of course. Entamoeba histolytica. Don't forget that. Okay, adverse reactions. Mostly GI, okay? Abdominal upset, whatever, nausea, blah, blah. Neuro, also headache, neuropathy, but that's not, you know, it's not important. I want to highlight disulfiram-like reactions for metronidazole. So tell your patients, do not go to the bar and drink alcohol. Avoid alcohol. Okay? What's going on here? Well, before we go to antimicrobacterial, anti um, nitrofurantoin. What's the use for nitrofurantoin? Pregnancy for uh, uncomplicated UTIs, maybe? Okay, nitrofurantoin, it is um, UTIs, right? Okay, in pregnancy. Why are we avoiding trimetoprim, sulfamethoxazole, and quinolones? They can cause <clears throat> positive defects. Excellent, excellent. Bactericidal or bacteriostatic for nitrofurantoin? Bactericidal or bacteriostatic? Bacteriocidal. Cidal. Cidal, cidal. It can kill the bacteria. However, careful, G6PD. It can trigger hemolysis in your G6PD um, patients. We're good so far? Yes. Yes. You can give it to pregnant women. Um, uh, you, you can give Rantoin to um, um, pregnant women that has a QTI. Okay. Don't give Bactrim and don't give fluoroquinolones. However, be careful. If the patient has G6PD deficiency, don't give it because it can induce extrinsic hemolysis. Okay? We're good so far, guys. You said you that nitrofurantoin was uh, bacteriocidal? Cidal, yes. Okay. Thank you. The mechanism is unknown so far. Okay. Yeah. We're good? See? Yes. No? I know it's a lot, guys. I know it's a lot. I think we're just going to finish um, pharmacology today, and let's set a date for, for the patho and for the infectious disease. Is that okay with you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's go then to anti-mycobacterial um, therapy. So guys, for this one, you, you just need to know like, of course, the pathophysiology of the mycobacterium, like tuberculosis and leprae, those are high yield. Oh, sketchy farm, sketchy micro, please do them if you have time. Should have been doing them, right? If you follow Grace's schedule to um, Price and Red Bull, or what is it called now? She changed it to um, Medhouse. Our house. Our house, yes. So follow um, her um, schedule there. Okay, good. So for antimicrobacterial M tuberculosis, you need to do ripe therapy. Rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, ethambutol. Let's go to rifampin. Rifampin, mechanism of action of um, rifampin. It inhibits DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, the nickel used in mycobacterium tuberculosis. Tell the patient, it's okay that you have a red tears or an orange tear, or the P is orange. That's okay. It's normal. 
right? It ramps up cytochrome P450. So if it's an inducer of P450 and you're worried about drug interactions, you can substitute rifampin, rifampin with your rifabutin. Okay, what's the mechanism of resistance? You know, they're very clever, these microorganisms. We're just going to modify the RNA polymerase then. Okay, so don't give this as a monotherapy. All right, that's a no-no. It should be in combination with the other drugs for TB. Isoniazid, isoniazid cat G, okay? It decreases synthesis of your mycolic um, acids via inhibition of the cat um, G. For isoniazid, think about peripheral neuropathy. So what vitamin are we gonna give to prevent the development of peripheral neuropathy? B6. B6. What is B6? What vitamin is it? Peroxidine. Peroxidine. Commonly used as a cofactor in what kind of reactions in the body? <clears throat> Remember my mnemonic? Oh, you forgot my mnemonic already. Decarboxylation. Remember B6? Pyridoxin is decarboxylation. Your biotin B7 is for carboxylation um, reactions, right? So, for example, decarboxylation of your histidine, B6 is your pyridoxin, right? Or pyridoxal um, phosphate, okay? So, histamine synthesis, don't forget that one. Hemoglobin synthesis, like... Um, what else? Neurotransmitter, it's, it's a cofactor, decarboxylation reactions, transamination, of course, don't forget that from term two. Beta group um, interconversion for any biochem geeks out there. So you give vitamin um, B6. So pyrazinamide, the only thing that's important here is, um, what is pyrazinamide? All of them are hepatotoxic, by the way. All of the drugs, for TB, they are um, hepatotoxic. Oh, pyrazinamide, don't forget, hyperuricemia as an adverse effect for that. Ethambutol, remember, optic neuropathy. But they're gonna get tricky. They're gonna say what kind of what kind of color blindness. So pick red green color blindness. Okay? Optic neuropathy, specifically red green color. Um, blindness. It's reversible. It's okay. Streptomycin, as I've said, is an old one. Adverse effect, tinnitus, vertigo, ataxia, and nephrotoxicity. A uh, high yield, your antimicrobial on prophylaxis. If you're exposed to meningococcal infection, don't forget you can give rifampin. If they are high risk for endocarditis and they're undergoing dental procedures, amoxicillin. History of recurrent UTI, Bactrim. For metoprim, sulfur, metoxicin. Okay, I found. What's going on here, Siri? I'm not talking to you. Malaria prophylaxis for travelers, atobacuum, proguano. Pregnant woman carrying group B strep, intrapartum penicillin G or ampicillin. Prevention of gonococcal, conjunctivitis in newborn, erythromycin on the eyes. Prevention of post surgical infection, cefazolin. Prophylaxis for strep, benzathine. And for HIV patients for prophylaxis for PCP is always Bactrim and toxoplasmosis, right? If for MAC, it's always um, macrolides, your azithromycin or your erythromycin. If they are MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, you give VANC, vancomycin, daptomycin, linazolid, tigacycline, ceftaroline, and doxycycline. If they are VRE, vancomycin resistant entero, Caucus, you can give linazolid, tigacycline, and streptogramins. These are new drugs, quinipristine and dalfopristine. If they are multi-drug resistant to pseudomonas and to acetinobacter, you give polymyxin B and polymyxin E. All right. We're good so far? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
I know we're we're almost we're almost there. Anti um, fungal therapy. This is a good slide that summarizes everything. <laughs> Ampho tericin um, B. What is this um, drug for? It binds ergosterol. It forms membrane. It pokes the fungal um, wall to allow the leakage of electrolytes. Clinical use, cryptococcus, blastomyces, coccidioides, and all of those um, good stuff. Systemic um, mycosis. For shake and bake for adverse effects, like fevers and chills, um, IV phlebitis, all right? Nephrotoxic. So hydration, and you can give liposomal amphotericin to decrease toxicity. You need to supplement potassium and magnesium because of the nephrotoxic effects. Nystatin, this is a swish and swallow. If the patient has thrush, oral candidiasis. How, do, how can we differentiate um, oral candidiasis from oral leukoplakia? How can we differentiate? This will scrape off easily. Exactly. And the leukoplakia doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the treatment swish and swallow for thrush and also topical for diaper rash or vaginal candidiasis. Flucytosine, it inhibits conversion to 5' prime fluorouracil by cytosine and the amines. Again, systemic fungal in infections, specifically cryptococcus meningitis in combination with amphotericin B. Most common is adverse effect is your bone marrow suppression. Now let's talk about the azoles. <clears throat> there is a lot of them. They all end in azoles, okay? Mechanism of action, high yield again, inhibits sterile synthesis. Clinical use, serious systemic mycosis and some local, you know, fluconazole for cryptococcal meningitis and AIDS, itraconazole for blastomyces, coccidiosis, histoplasma, sporothrix, um, shenki, clotrimazole and meconazole, topical fungal, high yield voriconazole, aspergillus, Voriconazole aspergillus. Adverse effect, just like your ketoconazole, it's a testosterone inhibitor. So you can have genital massa in men. And you have liver dysfunction. Terbenafine, high yield, it inhibits esqualine, squalene epoxidase. Clinical use dermatophytes, you know, specifically oncomycosis, the infection of your finger or your toenails. Adverse effects mostly like GI. Echinocandens, it ends in fungin. Caspofungin, mycafungin. Inhibit cell wall by inhibiting beta glucan. Use aspergillosis, invasive aspergillosis. Again, GI upset is an adverse effect. Griseofulvin, microtubule function. Commonly in dermatophytes. You use it in like a ringworm, tinea, tinea corporis. What's adverse effect? It has a lot. Teratogenic, carcinogenic. Why? Because of the microtubule. Microtubule affects <coughs> our body. So it has a systemic side effects. Confusion, headaches, they so firm like reaction. anti um therapy. Basically for this one, pyrimethamine for your toxo, suramine and melarsopro for trypanosoma. What is trypanosoma? Chagas, what is Chagas disease? Anyone? So there are two types, the South American and the African. African. Uh, just, uh, just tell me about the clinical. What can we see clinically in someone oh. that has um, Chagas? Related to the exactly. Cardiac yeah, symptoms, neural symptoms for if it's a chronic. Yep, 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 yep. good job. So um, for toxoplasma, what can we advise a pregnant woman for toxoplasma? Don't eat undercooked meat, stay away from cat litter. Exactly. Aside from toxoplasma, give me a pathology that has ring enhancing lesions in the CT scan of the head. Ring enhancing Herpes. lesions always associate with um, like 
toxoplasma, but can you give me other things? An abscess. Yeah, exactly. What else? Neurosis, tissarcosis. Don't forget that one. What else? Glioblastoma, multiforme. If it has been like um, a metastasis, a subacute infarct, what else? CMV. Um, I'm thinking about, um, for example, a demyelination. Like anything, for example, contusion, demyelination in the brain. You have an incom well, it, it has an incomplete ring, but it has a, a ring, right? Also, um, what else is in there? There's a mnemonic. Go to Radiopedia, radiopedia.org or .com and check for the ring-enhancing lesions. There's a good um, mnemonic there. Uh, Nefortimox, the Panasoma Kutsi. Again, sodium stibogluconate, leishmania. What is this? Leishmania. Leishmaniasis. Leishmania, it can cause what? Skin lesions. What? What is it? Your Donovani, right? Leishmania, Donovani. Um, what else is in there? Leishmaniasis. What is leishmaniasis? Kalazar. Yes, Kalazar. Right? Did you did you talk about this one or not yet? Yes. Yeah, yes. So you have genius, right? You have cutaneous um, leishmaniasis. You have, um, this is from the female sand fly. Right. Uh, yes, I remember this one. This is like um, from a female um, sand fly. Then you can have cutaneous. You can also have um, visceral. That's what I'm talking about. Kalazar is the visceral um, leishmaniasis. Why? This is the most serious form, right? Remember, this is very, very um, fatal because... It can damage your spleen, liver, visceral. For cutaneous, this is the most common form. It looks like a, like a bite, right? It's like a big bite. Okay, it, it just leaves an unpleasant looking um, scar in the end. You might confuse them with leprosy. Looks like that. Um, so what can we give for leishmaniasis? Sodium stiboglucosinate. Anti-mite. Anti louse um, therapy, permethrin, always. Permethrin cream, 5% cream. Right? Tell the patient to take it in the evening all over the body. Rub the cream all over the body and then rinse in the morning. Right? You can also give ivermectin, oral um, ivermectin. Okay. This is used to treat um, scabies, sarcoptis scabiae. Question. In physical exam, how do you know that uh, the patient has scabies? How do we know that the patient has um, scabies on physical examination? What can we see on the skin? Okay, first of all, what are we going to inspect? Is it like bites or little dots all over the skin? Um, uh, where can, where, what part? And you usually see the wrist, the fingers, the wrist, uh, and the... interdigits, interdigits, and check for borrowing. B U R R O W I N G. You can see the borrows, skin borrowing. It's like a tunneling. You can see like tunnels, interdigital. Okay, on the um, fingers specifically between the digits. Okay. Um, also for lice, ridiculous and curious. Chloroquine, okay. So it blocks the toxification of heme into hemoamzoin. This is for your plasmodium, your plasmodium um, falciparum, of course. If the patient has um, plasmodium um, falciparum, you can also give atovaquone and proguano, all right? For life-threatening malaria, you can use quinidine or, or artesanate. What's adverse effect? Retinopathy and pruritus. Anti-helminthic therapy, just think about PIMT, right? Parental palmoate, ivermectin, mebendazole, radziquantel, and diethyl carbamazepine. In our term, 
when I was term five last year, all of these are DLAs. So I don't know for you guys if you have a lecture for each and every one of them, but for us, it's only DLAs. No videos, like a big chunk of um, paper. All right, antiviral. We're still good? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is a good slide. Please know them. Right? It's just a good summary from your first aid. Okay. Let's do antiviral right now. Oseltamivir, zanamivir. Inhibits neuraminidase. So you decrease the <coughs> release of the progeny of virus. What's, what is it used for? Influenza A and <coughs> B. Acyclovir, pamcyclovir, valacyclovir. These are guanosine analog. Remember, they are not phosphorylated in uninfected cells. Okay? So you have a fewer adverse um, effects. They inhibit the viral DNA polymerase by chain termination. Clinical use, HSV and um, VZV, no activity against CMV, however, right? Use for HSV induced mucocutaneous and genital lesions, prophylaxis in immunocompromised um, patients. Balacyclovir has a much better oral or PO bioavailability than a cyclovir. For herpes zoster, please, the reactivation, please use FAM cyclovir. Adverse effect, kidney. Okay, that's a mechanism of resistance. Let's mutate the viral thymidine kinds. In terms of GAN cyclovir, this is used for CMV, right? You need the viral kinase for this to work. It inhibits the DNA, viral DNA polymerase. Clinical use, CMV, much more PO bioavailability, you can give valgan cyclovir. Adverse effects, bone marrow suppression. How do we confer resistance? Mute, just mutate the viral kinase. Foscarnet, viral DNA polymerase inhibitor. This is used for CMB retinitis. Don't forget that. And a cyclovir resistant HSV. UL27, I think, for Foscarnet. Adverse effect, nephrotoxic, of course. Some electrolyte abnormalities, which can lead to seizures. Specifically, hypokalemia can lead to seizures. Question, guys. The, the patient is hypokalemic, right? You keep, you keep on giving potassium. Still, it's hypokalemic. What's your next step in management? Give magnesium. You check for magnesium levels, right? Because usually if um, you need to resolve the hypomagnesemia first before resolving the hypokalemia, okay? Good. So how are we going to, to confer resistance? Let's mutate the DNA polymerase. So dofovir, it's like inhibits viral DNA polymerase. High yield CMV retinitis. It is nephrotoxic, so you need to give probenicid with this one and saline to decrease the toxicity. Oh, you ready for HIV therapy? Uh, can I just ask a question about um, the antiparasitic DLA you mentioned? Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you find um, like exam questions came from that DLA? Like, was it high yield? Um, they can get questions from everywhere, to be honest with you. But I mean, just group them into, like, um, for example, one drug. It can treat a lot, right? Right. There's a table at the end of the DLA that summarizes everything. Just memorize that one, I guess. Thank you. Is that, is that um, fair? Like, for example, albendazole, mebendazole, yes, your nematodes, your Nicator Americanus, your um, Strongyloides, right? 
and, and daughters. Yeah, but, you know, it was basically only a chart. It was just like a few yeah, like, colored just, charts. Just, just memorize that chart. Or much better, if you watch a sketchy micro or sketchy farm, sorry, sketchy farm. That's it. You're good to go. I don't know if they change it for your term, but when I was term five, I used to watch um, Pathoma, my favorite, Dr. Satar. Um, sketchy micro, sketchy farm. Sketchy path, sketchy path, I don't like it, sorry. Never used it. All right, let's go to HIV. N, R, uh, T, I's. Let me just um, check this one. What is an NRTI? So we have competitive inhibition binding to the reverse transcriptase, thereby terminating the DNA um, chain. Okay, so competitive inhibition of the binding of the nucleotide to the reverse transcriptase, thereby terminating the DNA chain. So the preceding DNA doesn't have an OH. And remember, for that bond to occur, you need that 3' OH, right? So if you don't have that, then there is no um, DNA synthesis, okay? Do I need to know the names? Yes. Tenofovir is a nucleotide. They need to be phosphorylated, high yield to be active, okay? Sudovodine, prophylaxis, pregnancy, to decrease the risk of the fetal transmission. All of them can have bone marrow suppression. All of them can have peripheral um, neuropathy, lactic acidosis, anemia in Zidobudine, pancreatitis high yield for divanosine. For abacavir high yield, contraindicated if the patient has HLA B5701 mutation due to increased risk of hypersensitivity. Abacavir, think about peripheral um, neuropathy. Didanosine, think about um, pancreatitis. All of them can have um, bone marrow suppression. Um, stab stabudine can have, what do you call this one? Like the fat, reduction of fat for um, stabudine. So they appear lean, right? And tenofovir is a nucleotide. And um, they all of them need to be phosphorylated to be active. Contrast that one with NNRTIs, which binds to reverse transcriptase at a site different from NRTIs. They do not require phosphorylation, which is good, right? Example, del delaverdine, efavirenz, and nivirapine. Toxicity, rash, hepatotoxic. And you can have vivid dreams and CNS symptoms with efavirenz. Now, integrase inhibitors. For this one, they have the word tegra in between them. Tegra vir, vir, that's why you know it's a viral because of the um, suffix vir. Tegra vir, you know it's an integrase inhibitor. Dulotegravir, elvitegravir, well, tegra vir. It inhibits HIV genome, right? By reversibly inhibiting HIV integrase. Toxicity increase in creatinine kinase. Protease inhibitors, they end in navir, navir. Indinavir, lupinavir, ritonavir, saquinavir. So the protease inhibitors, they prevent the maturation of your new viruses. Remember the pole gene? You need the pole gene for what? For your HIV-1 protease in order for the polypeptide to be cleaved. So the products of your HIV mRNA into their functional parts. You need the cleaving of that polypeptide. So the protease inhibitors, they prevent mutation, maturation of your new viruses. High yield ritonavir can boost other drug concentration because it's an inhibitor of your cytochrome P450. Um, high yield side effects, hyperglycemia, don't forget, lipodystrophy, Cushing-like syndrome, you have the buffalo hump, GI intolerance, nephropathy, and hematuria. 
Don't forget that rifam rifampin, it reduces protease inhibitor concentration, so use rifabutin instead. For entry inhibitors, infubertide binds GP41, inhibiting viral entry, and for maraviroc, it binds CCR5 on the surface of your T cells, inhibiting interaction with the GP120. Infubertide inhibits fusion, maraviroc inhibits docking. FC therapy, commonly asvir, buvir, pevir, low yield, just know them. They inhibit NS5A, NS5B, NS34A, basically. And most of the toxicity are like non-specific. But for this one, if they end in asvir or buvir and previr, they are for hepatitis C. All right, guys, I think that's the end of um, 